like a bull to, to the red. There was no doubt that that's what I was going to do. Mm. No question, no. But I also like this. No, I don't like anything else. This is it. This is it, which is a blessing and it's also a curse. When you don't get to do what you love so much, it's a curse in the hardest way to describe as an artist because you have to live and breathe this. You cannot possibly do this job, I think, unless you must do it to breathe. If there's anything else you can find in your life that you like doing, please do that. Because the sacrifice and the dedication and the utmost absorption this has to be in, in, in it for you, I think, in order to do it well, according to, in, in my opinion, I'm not saying how everyone else should do it, that's how I see it, there's nothing else. Filmmaker Magazine presents Back to One with Peter Rinaldi. Marta Milans is an actor. She sat down with me in New York City to talk about the work. Is there a typical way that you like to begin your preparation process? Is there a typical first step? I sit down, I have to have it in paper. If I know I'm gonna do it, I, ha I have to print it. It, it. it has to be physical. I read it, I don't read it a hundred times like Anthony Hopkins does um, right away. I, I heard he does that. It sounds amazing. What's important for me is when I first read it or when I'm reading it for the first couple of times, that I can imagine my character in the scene as if I were watching the movie. So I imagine that person right away, and, I, and if I can feel her right away, if I can feel her feelings, if I can feel her loneliness, her love for her children, for example, like Rosa in, in, in Shazam, yeah. her, her worry for her kids, like in this movie, I, I have to be so specific about the human feelings that this person has in the story that I'm reading, like in the circumstances of the script that I'm reading. Yeah. If I can feel her right away in those scenes, then I have her. Mm. And then I will continue to read it and then I will imagine her childhood and what I, what I do, which is, I got this from um, my beloved mentor, Larry Moss, mm. is her entire life, her childhood dreams, her political affiliation, what she likes to have for breakfast, if she drinks coffee or tea, mm. um, does she like to paint her nails red? Does she wear lingerie? Does she brush her teeth in a certain way? Like mm. I, I have to be so specific about mm. that mm -hmm. so that when you are finally on set and you've done all that homework, it, it's in you. It's like if you were interviewing me right now about who Mama Rosa is, I can answer any question, mm -hmm. ask her. Mm -hmm. That to me is the work. Also for me, acting in a country that's not my mother country, in a language that's not my mother tongue, I have to be double, like extra prepared because I have the language thing that no matter how bilingual right. someone is, there is a, there is a, a break, there is a, a moment of impasse where you have to remind yourself you're right. acting in English, you're acting in a language that's not right. the language that you were born in, right? Yeah. Um, which is funny because, for example, when I act in Spanish and I started my career in New York, in the Spanish repertory theater and then in, you know, Law and Order and like, you know, independent mm -hmm. stuff in New York City. So I, I mostly started my career in English. Mm. I came to NYU, I graduated from um, school here. So I started my career here, not in Spain. Mm -hmm. I would go back to Spain to to work out all my visa stuff as an immigrant, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so in, in those times that I would have to leave the country to like, you know, apply for this visa or this other visa, I would get work in Spain. You know, yeah. I got an agent, I, I wouldn't start, you know, getting TV shows and movies there. So doing that at the beginning, I'm a really fast speaker, as you can see, but I'm even faster in Spanish because mm -hmm. it's my mother tongue, right? So unbeknownst to me, because of the, the natural flow of what your mother tongue is, I would get my first TV job, right? <clears throat> I wouldn't stop stumbling on my words because I was speaking so fast. I was so accelerated, you know, in the scenes. And I thought, why is this happening to me? So I went to this amazing, incredible dialect coach in Madrid who passed away, sadly, 
Lydia, who taught from Javier Bardem to Penelope Cruz, to all the greatest mm -hmm. names in our business in my country. She's Ar she was Argentinian and she said, it is because the Castilian Spanish, because she's Argentinian, so it's a very different sound of the language, mm -hmm. right, than, than Spanish from Spain is. And she would say, it is because Castilian Spanish is a harsh language. We, we are very, T -t 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 this is how we sound, uh -huh. right, when we speak. Meanwhile, Argentinian Spanish is very musical. It's a mix of Spanish and Italian, so it's mm. slower and people just... So actors from Argentina... Mm. I don't know any Argentinian actor who isn't brilliant. Mm. And I'm like, why are they so good? They're just better than us. Why yeah. is that, you know? And it is, it's related to the language. Interesting. It's a, it's a staccato thing that sometimes is hard to flow with. So if it's your mother tongue, you get in your head because there is no separation like right. I was born in Spanish so it's I'm more mm -hmm. vulnerable because it's me it's Marta yeah. I get to speak in the language that I was born in right yeah. whereas acting in English Marta is over here then is English and then is the other yeah. character yeah so I'm protected by the language yes I, 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 I Marta's over here this is the language and this is the new character and I'm I'm safe you know yeah yeah so I figured that out about myself, which is why when I do auditions in English, when I obviously get jobs in, in the US, I, I absolutely have to be off book. Right. I can't improvise. Right, right, I, I just, right. I, I mean, I, I could jokingly, but uh, you know, I, I, I look at um, all these amazing comedians of SNL and I'm like, yeah. man, I just wish I had that talent. Yeah. I'll never have that talent. I can't, I don't have, I'm not yeah, from yeah. here, you know? Right, right. And I remember doing a, a scene in a movie with Bill Hader um, here in New York. And, you know, he didn't know this, but I was completely starstruck by the fact that he was an SNL comedian. Yeah. You know, and I was trying to make small talk and I played a hostess of this restaurant and he played the chef and, and there was a menu of the restaurant standing there. And I say, oh, we're waiting for the, you know, the set to be lit and mm -hmm. sound and whatever. And then, you know, he goes, so what, what would you order from this menu? And he just, he just looks at me straight up, serious, and, he's, and he whispers, asparagus. And I'm like, why, why are you whispering? And first of all, why, why would you order asparagus? And I say, they make, they make your pee smell like shit. I don't get it. It's like, they make your pee smell like shit? Really? So I say, no, no, I didn't mean, and then ca camera rolling, you know, take one. So then the director, who was a friend of ours, Ned Benson, <laughs> He came back out after the first take and he said, Marta, what, what were you guys rolling on about? And I said, mm. it, it involves pee and shit and asparagus. You're like, so he said, no, no, just riff on that. I said, I, I'm not going to riff on that <laughs> with Bill Hader from <laughs> SNL. Like, sorry, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the talent these wonderful people have is they make anything funny. Yeah. And that's something that you either have or you don't. Yes. I, don't I don't think I have it. But, but you... I thought the end of that story was going to be that you did, because you sound like you do have it, nah, right? No, nah. he, he didn't. He said, just, just continue with that and then take two. I, I didn't ask him because I didn't yeah. want it. You know, I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then he just went on. I, I had, had curled my hair in a very, you know, cheesy way. It was just like, just, just do something about this. And I said, what? But the, I, I guess I can't, I, I could try to keep up. Yeah, I know. It's like sparring with Muhammad Ali, right? This, this, yeah, yeah, it's not, uh, you could try. You could try. I mean, or like, you might get you know, a punch in. Yeah, or, <laughs> or like you have a plan, like Mike Tyson says, and then you get punched in the face. Yeah. Everyone has a plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure, I got a plan. I'm so funny, yeah. you know? And, and right, it, right. <laughs> it's just him too, which I'm actually proud of that because Mama Rosa is the, you know, the core heart of the film yeah. and she is the character that everyone gravitates towards and loves because she brings all these kids together from yeah. different walks of life, unwanted kids with, you know, all kinds of different issues. And she creates a home with her husband of love and, and, and inclusivity, right? And that I think in this day and age, it's so needed, right? Yeah. So, but, you know, no one thought that Mama Rosa could be funny. And I got my one-liner and I delivered, man. Nice. nice and I nice. see it, I saw a clip of it and I thought, you know what? She's actually funny. <laughs> I didn't know Mama Rosa was funny, man. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, nice. But did you get to, you said you wanted to fly in this one. Did you get to fly? I said I wanted is to this, fly. Is this I, a spoiler? You, you um, probably can't see You know this. what? It's okay because they cut 
part of the scene out of the movie, so <laughs> I will just tell you that I get to fly. Whoa! I'll just that. Whoa! I get News. to fly. There might be some assistance involved right, in the okay, flying. Right, okay, okay. But I'm Technically flying. Technically yeah. flying. And um, it was actually hilarious because I'm flying next to Jaiman, who plays the wizard. Right, right, right. And I won't tell you the specifics because I don't want to get yeah, into trouble. But that's right. I will tell you, though, that filming that scene is one of the most hilarious moments in, in the movie. Uh, in the filming of the movie, number one. But especially in me filming with Jaiman uh -huh. because it was incredibly hot. The five months in Atlanta during the summer, hot Atlanta. Oh, yeah. Not last summer, the summer before. And uh, which is fine with me because I'm from Spain. So everyone is like, ah, it's so hot. I was like, guys, just chill out. It's yeah. better than minus <laughs> million Fahrenheit in Toronto when we did the first movie. Right. So everyone chill the fuck out, right? So I, let's just say that we're flying, right? There's this huge fans, huge fans, as big as this wall. Yeah. To make wow. it look as though you're flying, wow. you know, yeah. in, in the sky. Yeah. And Jaiman, sadly for him, he had to wear this um, dreadlock wig made of wool. Oh God! In in his on his head and also his beard. Yeah. So imagine in, in that heat, and I mean that was obviously in in, in the studio in the, inside a stage. What we did about the flying part, but it's Atlanta, and yeah. he was pretty miserable wow. all summer. Poor guy. But the funny thing to me was. You know, we're like, oh, we're flying. This is just awesome. You know, take one. And then because of the speed of the fan, <laughs> his, and, uh, no one else was seeing it, but his beard was just coming unglued, you know, oh, God. and flapping on the side of his cheek. And I'm supposed to be engaging with him and keep my shit together, but I, I, I just had to call it. I was like, I can't, guys. <laughs> Guys, are you guys. watching the monitor? <laughs> is on. anyone watching the monitor? Because this is just hilarious. Yeah, there's there's great there's great funny moments. I mean, this should have come out years ago, right? Because the pandemic really stopped. Well, we should have filmed. I mean, filmed little did we know we were going to be number one in the world with the first movie, which is insane. And the love the world has had for our yeah. film is 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 beautiful, and especially because of the, of the subject matter, the social s subject matter underneath you yeah. know it's not just any superhero movie right. it has it has a lot of message to me especially having always worked with um children in, in different capacities in in my personal life mm. and s happened which of course you know nothing is coincident in their life right mm. but to end up being cast as the mom to all these kids from all walks of life in such a big movie with such mm. a big impact and and have so many kids all over the world feel identified with yeah. this it's like oh it's it's cool to be number one in the world yeah. because of that, right? Right, right, right. So we get obviously the sequel order right away, and then COVID hits. Oh. And sadly, I mean, no, not sadly, this is just reality. My kids grow. So <laughs> right, grow. that's right. I forgot about that. <laughs> and they grow so fast. <laughs> so we had to wait two years to go into production, oh almost God. a year to make it, God. and then two years for the movie to get finalized. Right. So. We can't wait for this to come out, you know. <laughs> by the time by the time it comes out, <laughs> Darla Faith, who's my youngest one, who was ten in the first movie, right. she's gonna be she's gonna get, be getting married. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You know. Oh so God, I forgot. About that's this. the downside of being in movies that are this big is that it takes a long. I mean, and you know, special effects and post production yes. and CGI yes. and all that stuff. It just takes a long time to get a thing oh, finalized it's right. just how it is you know just how it is. i mean unless you know in two years chat gpt will be <laughs> doing the post-production of all this no not movies. doing the pros but but doing everything yeah he'll be, he'll be taking my roles as well <laughs> yes you know singing in spanish next thing you know so there's that let's go way 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 back i heard and this can't be true you were doing Shakespeare at eight years old. That is true. <laughs> That's actually correct. I have what? photos to prove him. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to show sure. you. What are you just? And I'm and I'm being serious. You know seven languages. Are mm -hmm. you well, a, so, uh, six and three quarters? Okay. Because <laughs> I'm studying Russian now, and I, I can't languages. have a full on conversation in Russian, so I won't uh, right. certify that, that, that I'm fluent. But I can sort of try to get by an order. Are you some kind of genius? No, no, no. Officially. I am just good with languages, and the reason I'll tell you why I'm good with languages, I'm looking for the photo just for 
people listening. So you will really <laughs> oh, that, know. That'll do good for the podcast. You re- <laughs> <laughs> oh, here it is. Here it is. I found it. Here it is. All right. Let me, Go- uh, let me announce to the... Oh Goneril God. and King Lear. And uh, I'll find King you. Lear? King Lear. <laughs> I did. Gone, it's not like was, gone, yeah, 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 exactly. It's Romeo not, and Juliet. <laughs> oh my or like, what to do about nothing? Yeah. <laughs> Happy go lucky. And it was King Lear. Wow. Goneril, who's not having it. Um, you know, the the way this makes sense to me is there's this wonderful uh, uh, documentary everybody should know about called Hobart's Shakespeareans. It's mm. about this dude in Arizona, I think, who teaches Shakespeare to to little children. Oh, and wow. they're learning it and they're crying. They're reading it and crying. Like they're getting it. They're, they're getting, getting so it. much more than, and that is like a miracle movie to me because you, wow. you wouldn't Ho- believe it. Ho- Hobart's, Hobart's Shakespeare. Hobart's Shakespeare. Look it up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's, so this makes sense then. But I'll right? tell you, so not to, because I'm definitely not a genius, far from it, but my grandmother who's still with us, 96 years old, fought oh, COVID, COVID twice. And wow. she's the one that, teased me into studying Russian because she said, huh, you speak six languages. I speak one more than you. You're going to let your grandmother die speaking one more language than Whoa. you? It's like, no, I am not. <laughs> and that would be Russian. So then I get to my R- Rus- Russian teacher. Her name is Lana. I have, I have her in LA. And I do my lesson, which is basically Pilates for the brain because you're learning oh, a different alphabet, Cyrillic, which is different from ours. Oh, that's right. Letters are different. A that's C right. in our alphabet that's is an, an S. Insane an language. H in Russian is an N for us, oh, God. et cetera, right? Yeah. So I will get that and then, you know, say my four verbs of, you know, Ya vodu zavtra kaju zavtra, and I, I'm, I'm like, oh, yeah. I, I'm gonna have breakfast tomorrow, and I remember the sentence, and then I call my grandmother and I tell her this because I just had, I'm fresh from the lesson, right? Yeah. And then her response will be, yeah, the accent is just not great. Uh, oh God. Wow, tough crowd over here. <laughs> wow. So that woman, her name is Julia. Um, that uh, my my last name Milan is named after her. I have a different legal last name, mm. but it's in honor to her because how much I love her. Mm. And also, it's easier to pronounce for Americans mm. than my legal last name. Mm-hmm. So my grandmother wanted me to be a violinist. She's a lover of classical music, and I started playing the violin at age three. Mm. Did not particularly like it. So at age seven, in my music academy, when I was miserable uh, learning hours and hours of musical language you develop an ear for anything because of that, mm. which is why I developed an ear for uh, languages. Um, yeah. It's because of that, is the, the musical ear, no doubt. Yeah. I wanted out of that, and then yeah. the, the head of the music academy was coming in one day saying, we need a girl who's, who can memorize all this. I, I do have a good memory, that, that's true. And <clears throat> it's this play by Michael Ende who wrote Never Ending Story, and it's mm. about a turtle who goes to Africa and she gets invited to the wedding of the, of the king and queen of Africa, the lions. And I, I said, can I, mm. I want that role. Mm-hmm. Got it, auditioned, nailed it, got the role. Oh, wow. And then next year after that, I was doing Shakespeare. Wow. And, then that, and then that was it, violin. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't think yeah, I want to yeah, keep yeah, doing yeah. this. Yeah. So it's amazing when I look back at the fact that I, it was, it was, it was just like a bull to, to the red, you yeah. know? There was no doubt that that's what I was going to do. Mm. No question, no, mm-hmm. but I also like this. No, I don't like anything else. This mm-hmm. is it. This mm-hmm. is it, which is a blessing. And it's also a curse mm-hmm. when you don't get to do what you love so much. It's a curse right? Um, in the hardest right. way to describe as an artist, because you have to live and breathe this. You cannot possibly do this job, I think, unless you must do it to breathe. If there's anything else you can find in your life that you like doing, please do that. Because the sacrifice and the dedication and the utmost absorption this has to be in, in, in it for you, I think, in order to do it well, according to, in, in my opinion, I'm not saying how everyone else should do it, that's how I see it, there's nothing else. So for many yes. years, it was, not clear that I was going to be able to live of this, you know? Mm. I mean, it still isn't, actually. And and you didn't know anyone when you came here. No. You didn't have any connections. No. You didn't have any, any, any uh, not even any friends in New York. Right? I did not. I had a, a, a cousin that I, I had been told that he was my cousin. 
by marriage, so not really. Yeah. Meaning, like, I had a person to call who lived out town, and I called his friend and I said, my cousin Christian, I said, hi, I'm your... <laughs> I guess I'm your niece or your cousin. <laughs> I guess you gotta take care of me. <laughs> Somebody. And he's like, uh, come to my apartment on Friday. I'm throwing a dinner party, you know? Um, but um, I, I just grew up watching movies with my mom, and who's a lover of film. And all the movies happened in New York City. And yeah. I thought, I wanna live there. And I wanna, I wanna do theater, I wanna be on Broadway. I wanna, I wanna do that. And, I am no one without the parents that I have, mm -hmm. no one. I would not be anywhere near where I am if it weren't for the parents and the, and the upbringing that I've had, which is completely blessed in every single possible way, mm. especially because no one in my family ever doubted me. They said, oh, maybe you shouldn't do that because that's hard, or you should be a lawyer. You should... No one ever said that to me, ever. Mm. So because no one questioned me, yeah. I never question myself. Right. And I always tell this to friends of mine that are trying to like shape what their kids should be or, mm. or protect them from what they should not do in life or whatever as far as career goes. I said, no. Yeah. No. Take it from me. I, yeah. I was able, if I had known how hard this was going to be, right. maybe I wouldn't have done it. Right. But I didn't know. I was, right. that innocence and that in sheer passion took me be made me fearless and took me everywhere right. thinking i don't care i'm gonna do this mm -hmm. i'm gonna do this and in the the lowest times in my life which i've had a lot in this career and especially in la which is one of the loneliest places you know they call it los angeles and it feels like there are no angels there you know um, <laughs> yeah. and those are the times that i've been um self-doubting myself the most and my my young sister who is like my soulmate, she lives, well, she lived in Hawaii for 15 years. She just moved to Seattle, but I would go visit her, you know, and one time, this is a few weeks before I got Shazam. I was in one of those, you know, lulls of, I don't know if I can keep doing this. You know, she had gotten married. She was about to have a baby. My brother had, had just had her, his daughter or was going to, um, I was single, older than my two siblings, the eldest, seven years older than my sister thinking, what am I doing? I'm not even, I don't have a, any stability of any kind. I don't even, I have to rent my apartment in New York because I'm broke. Mm -hmm. I am subletting a sublet of the sublet of the sublet and subletting someone sublet of the car. That's, mm -hmm. you know? Like for what? To do a guest star on some, it's like, I just, I don't know if I can. And I was, I went to see her and I, you know, I was smoking a cigarette outside in her garden crying and because I, I didn't want her to see me crying and she came out and she's, she's like, says, I don't know how else to cheer you on. Like, uh, and I think of this and I start crying because she said, I don't know how else to help you. And I said, she said to me, is there anything else you see yourself doing, you know? Mm. And I said, no. Mm. And she was like, you just have to keep going. Mm -hmm. You just have to keep going. And that's why I say to people, the perception is so warped of what this business is so yes. not what it really is in so many ways we just see the success of our fellow actors when we are like looking pretty in dresses in the red carpet mm -hmm. and with our makeup and getting photographed that's one day that's two hours in one day mm -hmm. one time every couple of years right if you're lucky right. you know the rest of the time is getting the work, working on your craft, getting told no a million times a day because you're not right. pretty enough, you're not tall enough, you're not Latina enough, my eyes are too green, mm -hmm. you have freckles, oh, you're Spanish, but you know, you don't really look Spanish. Oh, but your name is Spanish, but you don't really look like you're from Idaho either. Mm -hmm. So, oh, what do we do with you, you know? Mm -hmm. This is my situation and you know, everyone has their own story. But man, you, you really have to love this yeah. like you love chocolate ice cream <laughs> like yes. I do yeah otherwise it's um it's a lot but how did you develop a way of auditioning that you were able to survive that because you're saying a thousand no's you know what I mean like because you love it I imagine that just being able to do it even in a room like that was part of the work oh uh, I've never been a a great I actually don't know if I'm a great auditioner or not, but I will tell you that 
this COVID thing of isolating all of us and reducing our window of opportunity to self tapes is extremely detrimental to me. Yeah. I win with people. I, yeah. I thrive in collaboration. I enjoy being around someone telling me, do this, let's explore this other avenue. What if this character did it like this? Let's try it this way. With the casting director, with the director, with the right. producer, with an executive, whatever it is. Right. You take that away. Right. You're sitting in your kitchen with a buddy of yours or a neighbor or your husband, and it's not the same. It's just right. not the same. Um, I, I love the hunt. I love the competition. I'm, I, I've always been, you know, an, a, a little on the extreme side of wanting to win, you know, everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wanting to win the race, wanting to win at sports, <laughs> wanting to win. Um, so you take that away and it, 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 it just feels devoid of, of the same intention and the same importance. Yes. Um, yes. I do hope we will we'll go back to in-person auditioning. I don't know if that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, I think it's hurting our business. I think it's hurting our community of actors. Mm. I don't think it's fair to have us deal with the lighting, the tripod, it's the not, editing, the fair. sound. Just pay, pay us. I pay us for this. Because we're doing the jobs point. that, you know, that I know of. You would go to a casting office and a casting director would be doing that with you. It's a very good And point. now it's on us. So I'm very upset It takes upset a lot it. of time. Well, to do that. of course, it takes a lot of time. Yeah. It's on another, you know, getting, having either an audition room that you can go to, even having an audition studio, having a certain backdrop that's convenient, right. having a certain time of the day that's convenient for you to be able to do it. Because not, not everybody has a huge room that they can set up yeah. just for auditions, you know? Right. So I, I just don't like where the business is right now. And uh, this yeah. is, I don't know if my manager will be upset at me for saying this about the audition process, but it's just, it's just not fair on all of us. I'm sorry. And yeah. COVID is over. I'm yeah. sorry. The, the dangers of COVID are yeah. over. Yeah. It's not what it was a year and a half ago. That's right. And I just don't think it's fair. That's the other thing. Do you think that there's, have you, have you been, um, yeah, you have been in production. Um, During COVID? Yeah. Well, well, and, Shazam. And post -COVID, right. Shazam right. too. It was, Shazam it too. was not great. Don't you think that needs to be changing now? The idea of this mask being on, the, we're, we're, we're trading in the currency of this kind of connection that has to happen on a set. And these 100%, masks are 100%. really affecting that. I, I was actually worried for our movie. Thankfully, we have a, a wonderful <laughs> editor and a great director, David, who, who made sure that wouldn't happen. But the process of filming during COVID with all these COVID rules and the insurances and the liabilities and all this stuff that I understand all of it from the business perspective. I understand all of it from the insurance perspective. It was, at least we could go back to production. So we're thankful for that. Yeah. But it was horrible. It was horrible. It was horrible to rehearse scenes with my kids that are oh. kids. They are kids. They might be actors, but they are, they're children. Oh. How are you going to be? improvising, rehearsing, a dinner scene when we're all together and the, the mask, the, 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 take it off, you take it off, but I don't take it off. Mm -hmm. It was not conducive to creating an atmosphere of familiarity in, on set. It just wasn't. Yeah. I mean, not for me, not for anybody. Of course, you yeah. know, crew members had to do it as well. Right. Um, we are the ones that could take our masks off while we were filming, but not in rehearsal, you know, and it's, it's just... Obviously, everyone has been navigating this new reality or new normal or whatever, however we've been able to and however, however we can. But I hope that'll go away because it, it, it did not feel like you say, we create universes of emotions. We create uh, alternate realities. We, we, we create all of that. And to, to, in order to create that, we need the conducive environment to do so. And it, yeah. It, it was hard. It was hard to create yeah. that in, in, in COVID times, for sure. Yeah. I, wonder, I wonder if we're going to be able to see the effects of that in the actual products. Maybe not now, because uh, we're too close to it, but maybe there'll be a time where, like, why does this feel weird? Oh, it's because it was filmed during COVID. You know, I, I hate I, to say I, that. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that is the case. I, I luckily don't see that in our film, and yeah. I was kind of... You know, it was a long time and many things happened. And of course, there were COVID scares and people tested positive and the whole thing. Um, and you, 
you watch the movie and it's, I don't think it's there and I, you forget. Yeah. Which is good. That's you know? good. Yeah. What, what other things like, can you talk about what you need on a set to do your best? Is there a certain amount of rehearsal that you would mm-hmm. like that maybe you don't get all the time that you need? Do you need a certain environment that feels a certain way for you to get your best? Um, I need for sure a certain environment, definitely. Um, rehearsal, definitely. I need music in mm. my trailer, always. Um, what kind of music is that? It depends on the character and it depends on the scene. So you want it to wor- work with the character? Yes, yes, yeah, yes, definitely. I, I, have, um, I, I bring my, <clears throat> my diary off the character to set when it's conducive to do so, obviously. And I write, um, cause you know, as you know, you know, you, there's so much waiting around when you're yeah. filming movies <clears throat> and TV shows. So I, I, I do that to really get into the atmosphere of whatever scene we're doing that day or whatever the character is. I create a very lengthy playlists on Spotify of mm-hmm. my characters mm-hmm. so that when I have to get inspired to a, for a certain emotional state of the character, I can plug right into that. Yeah. So all that homework that you do when you are on set and you, you know, have a scene where your son might die or something that means the stakes are raised super high in in the story, you can dive right into that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's usually big sets or sets in general are just very busy. You know, right. you have you know technical crew and you have the lighting and you have hair makeup and you have um camera if it's a close-up you know you have your camera over here and you have the mic over here and, and the people are you have a lot of people around you all the time that's distracting on on a human level just you have a lot of human bodies around you you know and if you have to remove yourself from that not physically because you are there but emotionally you have to be somewhere else um it it helps me to have done the homework with the music as well especially mm-hmm. where i have my my headphones and i just get right into that zone you had a lot of things against you in this business you didn't have you didn't know people you didn't know this is not your first language you conquered this what is the next step that you want to conquer now do you know what I mean? Now that you get to understand this mm-hmm. business, now that you have a handle on your craft, what do you imagine being the next hill that you want to climb here? I'm directing my first uh, film this summer in Spain, a short film with a wonderful director um, and friend, Eric Howell. Um, I did a film with him a few years ago and we've been collaborators since. And I just want to learn that aspect. I, I am I'm blown away by the capacity of being the captain of a ship in all the forms that that requires you to be. So I'm going to start small with this short film and learn from the best. And I think we're so blessed to be alive, to be healthy, to be able to live your life and not be, you know, um, tied to a bed with sickness or malady, you know, and be able to have the strength and, and the mental capacity to do what we love. And I'm so aware of that blessing that I have, that there's always room for improvement, for learning, for getting better at anything, at everything. You know, I, I was just telling my two friends, I really think I have to get another degree in something. There's more time. I feel like before I start a family, like I just need to learn more. I, maybe filmmaking, maybe film directing, maybe producing. I have a few projects that I'm developing to to pitch as TV shows. I have the rights of this incredible story of a relative of mine during World War II that I want to bring to the U.S. Mm. And, and, and make into a movie or a limited series. So I realized um, being in a relationship with a director a few years ago from Spain, very dear to me. And, you know, being the actress and being with a director who was at the top of his game and understanding his process and what it's about. He was going to be a, about to direct a studio film and, and what that entailed and all uh, what that was and the storyboards and the mood boards and all these things that I, you know, I've never seen in my life. I've never been with a director. And I thought, wow, this is 
fascinating. But the business side of it, in my um, humble approach of, I want to be at the top of my game in the craft of acting, and I want to get it all the way to Hollywood, and I want to work there, and I'm going to do it, and I did it, right? Or at least I continue to try to do it. It's never stable. But then you see the other side, and, and I say, oh, I wouldn't ever dare to produce. I would never dare to direct. Guess what? We're all learning, and we are all figuring shit out as we go along, all of us. Top of the game, lowest of the game. So a lot of the times we think, oh my God, so-and-so or, or this uh, part of the business, you know, it's, it's untouchable. It's something that I have no idea if I could ever dream of being part of. Guess what? Do it. Go do it. And if you don't know how to do it, partner with someone that will teach you. Get a mentor. Go to class. Study that part of, of the business that you don't understand. Surround yourself by people that you can learn from. Because guess what? You can do it. We can all do stuff. Some better than others, for sure. Some, so that's why some people excel at something and, and whatnot. But just what, you're not going to do it because you're going to be afraid that you might fail? What if you fly? Right. <laughs> Instead of falling down the window, what if you fly? Did you try? Try, man. That's my MO. Just try. I love that. <clears throat> Martin Lanz, thank you so <laughs> much for this. You're welcome. Thank you for coming over. Back to One is a production of Filmmaker Magazine, which is a publication of The Gotham, formerly IFP. Listen to back episodes of this podcast at filmmakermagazine.com or wherever you get your podcasts.